Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming this Sunday. I think you chose wisely to come here because we are having a great afternoon together here. Uh, my name is Reto Bula. I'm in charge for the program here at the Cosmos. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, we have two brilliant scientists here, and I think we're going to hear a lot about interesting topics. Neuroscientist Sarah Jane Blakemore, she searches on the brain during adolescence. That's a very interesting topic, especially for me. I'm having a teenage, oh, I'm having a teenage daughter, so uh, um, I hope I hear a lot of uh, things that will help me through this time. Um, then we have the psychologist Paul Bloom. He will talk about empathy, something very important in nowadays society anyway, and in general. Uh, and the talk will be, well, you, the talk master or the mistress, I can say, will be Olivia Cuny. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much also to the Jacobs Foundation, especially to Sabine Gysi and Gail Joffet. How do you say this in English? Did you? Gelcho, Gelcho Fates, whatever. So <laughs> that's the way. To, and uh, thank you very much for everything. I thank you for the, um, also for the APRO we'll have later on. They invite us for drinks and food afterwards at five o'clock. So that's an important message after that. Um, this will be at five o'clock, by the way. Uh, another thing, maybe a little advertising, while I'm having the microphone, I use that shamelessly. Um, we have Ben Moore here, Professor Ben Moore. He's an astrophysicist and cosmologist. Uh, every month he's having talks here. If you haven't been here, you, you should come. It's very, very funny, interesting. Is there life on Mars? If there is, why? Why not? And so it's interesting topics he's having. So you should come on the 20th of June. So that's all there is. Thank you very much for coming. And I give the microphone now to Olivia Cooney and have fun. Bye. Hello everyone, it's very nice to have you here. We are gonna talk today about one of the most fascinating subject there is, becoming human. A conversation about empathy and the social brain. It's also one of the most interesting, most fastest uh, scientific fields there is right now. And at first, I'm gonna welcome Paul Bloom. He's professor of psychology at Yale University author of Just Babies, The Origins of Good and Evil, and also How Pleasure Works, both very re very recommendable books. He also has a course on Coursera for those of you who like online learning. And he's carried off the Research Prize 2017 by the Jacobs Foundation. And he's gonna talk today about this book that uh, steered a lot of controversy against empathy as a moral guide. Please welcome Paul Bloom. Thank you. Um, I started writing about empathy a few years ago, and I had something that was going to be published in a magazine that was critical about empathy. And before it came out, I was really excited. I figured it would get this really interesting response, and people would be enthusiastic about me criticizing empathy and exploring it. So right before it comes out, I go on social media to see um, what people are going to be saying about this. And this is the very first thing I see. And um, this kind of <laughs> set the tone for discussions that followed. And so what I want to do in this 10 minutes we have together is try to convince you, if I can't convince you uh, to be against empathy, at least I'll try to convince you it's not, it's not the dumbest thing ever. <laughs> So part of the problem is terminological. People use the term empathy to mean different things. Some people use it to mean everything good, concern, compassion, and so on. I'm not using the term that way. In fact, I believe that these things are important, and I think empathy gets in the way of, of, of achieving them. Others use it in a narrower sense to describe the ability to figure out what people are thinking and feeling. And I'm not against this either. Um, this is sometimes called theory of mind or mind reading or emotional intelligence. And if you want to make the world a better place, you need this. You need to know what makes people happy, what, people, what makes people sad. On the other hand, like any form of intelligence, this could be used for good or for evil. So if you're a seducer or a torturer or a con man, you'll also benefit from knowing how other people work. In any case, the sense of empathy I'm most interested in was nicely spelled out hundreds of years ago by the philosopher Adam Smith. So Adam Smith describes, says that when we um, feel empathy for another, 
uh, we place ourselves in his situation and become in some measure the same person with him and thence form some idea of his sensations and even feel something which, though weaker in degree, is not altogether unlike them. In other words, we put ourselves in other people's shoes. And there's a rich work, body of work in psychology and neuroscience exploring this. There are a lot of studies, for instance, which get somebody in a, in a lab and they watch as someone else is being poked or shocked or mildly burnt. And it turns out that the very same parts of their brain that would be active, if they themselves were poked or shocked or mildly burnt, become active to a lesser extent when they observe them. And you can see empathy all over the place. That Sometimes it's very dramatic um, as you feel empathic suffering with another. Um, and the fans of empathy will tell you it works like a spotlight. So I look at all of you and it's kind of a sea of faces, but I zoom in on you and I try to feel what it's like to be you and that connects me to you and that makes me care more about you, more likely to be kind to you. And I think this metaphor is a good one, but I think the metaphor also illustrates the problems with empathy. So spotlights have a narrow focus and they only illuminate where you point them at. And as a result, I think empathy and morality based on empathy tends to be both biased and enumerate. And you see the bias in all sorts of ways. It's well known. This is a cartoon done at the height of the Ebola crisis, meant to, to, to depict the fact that there was an enormous amount of attention and concern and care for the very few light-skinned victims of the disease, and largely ignoring the far more numerous dark-skinned victims of the disease. One of my favorite neuroscience studies was done in Europe. They took men, and the men watched as another man was given electric shocks and was writhing in pain. If the man was described as being in the same soccer team, a fan of the same soccer team as the subject, the subject's brain would light up with empathic distress and it would wiggle in response to the suffering of the other man. But if he was described as not being of the same, a fan of the same soccer team, empathy circuits would largely shut down and parts of the brain devoted to pleasure would light up as they watched them. <laughs> the numeracy part is well known. Um, if you hear about a thousand people dying in a ferry accident in a faraway land, you don't feel 10 times worse than if you hear about 100 people. Largely when we let our emotions rule, numbers don't matter anymore, even when they should. This is illustrated in a classic study about 30 years ago where they asked people, how much money would you pay to, to, to rescue birds that were soaked with oil? And if you tell them about 2,000 birds, people say on average about 80 bucks, 80 American dollars. Tell another group, 20,000 birds, they'll say, eh, $78. Numbers don't matter. And when you rely on your empathic connections, on your feelings more generally, you get these sort of moral blind spots. Now, you might be saying, OK, so empathy isn't perfect. But still, it's such a force for good, it makes the world a better place. But there are numerous examples where it doesn't work that way, where it actually makes the world worse. Um, one example. I've thought of a lot as child beggars. So if you go to parts of Africa and India, there's child beggars all over the place, and it's, it's, it's almost irresistible for a rich, well-fed you know, person. It, it, there's tremendous compulsion to give them money. But most people who analyze the situation say, when you do so, you make the world worse. Um, because these children are not autonomous. They're, they're often ruled by criminal organizations that enslave and often maim them. If you want to help, there's other ways to do so, but this is not a good way to do so. I was once on a radio program uh, in London years ago with a minister. We were talking about kindness, and I gave that example. And this was like this live radio program. And she said to me, and I said this, and she said to me, that's the worst thing I've ever heard. She said, when I see a suffering child, I give, and our hands touch, and I feel this warmth and love. Now, I'm both non-confrontational and slow-witted, so I think I said, OK, I got to think about that. But now, years later, I have a response, which is, it depends what you want. If you want to feel good about yourself, if you want to feel a rush, that's exactly the right thing to do. If you want to actually help people and make the world a better place, you should do something different. It gets worse. If you think about atrocities like the lynchings of blacks in the American South or the Holocaust in Europe, and there's all sorts of motivations for these, but one motivation is empathy. Not for the people who are being killed, of course, but for those said to be their victims. Whenever a demagogue tries to get people to strike out at a group, 
they tell these powerful stories about the victims of the group. Stories such as of, uh, of um, white women being raped by black men, of German children being preyed upon by, Jew by, by Jewish pedophiles, and they use our empathy for the victims to catalyze hatred against that group. Um, and none of this is just a historical fact. Anti-immigrant sentiment uh, in, in, in Europe and in the States is driven often by powerful and moving stories about suffering, people who suffer at the hands of illegal immigrants. And this, these empathic feelings are leveraged to motivate people to, um, to, to lash out at the immigrants. Now, you might say right now, OK, but what do we have if not empathy? as a matter of being kind. Some people made that argument. You need empathy to help out other people. But I think that shows a failure of moral imagination. Every religious tradition, every philosophical tradition has granted that there are numerous ways to, um, to motivate kindness. Um, the, the, the Buddhists distinguish between sentimental compassion, what I'm calling empathy, versus great compassion. They argue the second one is far better. It doesn't exhaust us. It's more fair. It's less biased. And there's research showing this sort of split. So there's a wonderful collaboration between uh, the German neuroscientist Tanya Singer and the Buddhist monk and biologist Matthew Ricard. And what they do is they train groups of people either to feel great empathy for suffering, so they train them to f put themselves in their shoes, feel the pain of others, or feel compassion and love, but no empathy. And they find that these two different types of training, they activate different parts of the brain. But for me, much more interesting, they have different consequences. So as they summarize in the current biology article, um, compassion is another, an, an other related emotion, gives rise to positive feelings, to love, to good health, to approach and social motivation. In our own laboratory, we find that people who are high in compassion and low in empathy tend to help others and do so joyously. But empathy leads to empathic distress which is a self-related emotion, connects to negative feelings and stress, poor health and burnout. And instead of helping, if you feel a pain of others too intensely, you withdraw. It's too much for you. Now, somehow you might be getting the impression now that I'm against empathy. Nothing could be further from the truth. I'm in favor of empathy in its proper place. So for instance, empathy is a great source of pleasure. This is my younger son from a while ago. Oh, thank you. Um, uh, he's now 22 years old and shaped like a beer, so it's kind of different. So this is a, but but Adam Smith himself noticed that empathy could be a great source of pleasure, feeling the, the, the joy of others. One of the great thrills of being a parent is you get to experience things you've experienced a thousand times before: uh, uh, fireworks, a hot fudge sundae, the, uh, a Hitchcock movie. You get to experience them for the first time all over again through the eyes of your child. Um, literature, novels, novels, movies, TV shows, get so much of their pleasure because we just enjoy reliving the experiences of others. So I'm all for empathy in its proper place. But what I'd like to suggest is, as a moral guide, as a way to, to decide what to do, how to shape the world, how to make people's lives better, it's a train wreck. And we're much better off with some combination of rationality and compassion. Rationality and what we use our capacity for reason to figure out what we can do to make the world a better place. And compassion where our care for others, not our empathy, but our care and our love for others motivates us to do so. So I am against empathy. And I'd like to hope that I can convince some of you to join me in the crusade. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. All of you, or at least some of you, will get to ask questions. But first, I have the privilege to chat with you, Paul. Uh, you make a lot of examples in your book about what would be better as a moral guide than empathy. And there is one sentence that's stuck in my mind particularly, and that is when you wrote, it doesn't matter if food to starving child is delivered via drone or by a smiling ed worker. So that's just one example that you give. And when I read that sentence, I was wondering, really, is that really true? Or to ask an even dumber question as that uh, 
Twitter member would, would say, is morality even the most important thing? Is it really important to do good instead of what makes us feel good? It's a great question. Um, we have many motivations, and I wouldn't deny it for a second, one of our motivations is pleasure, is feeling good about ourselves, is satisfaction, is enhancing our reputation. A lot of pleasure, some of them selfish, and that's a, a huge part of our psyche. But I think on top of that, we're extraordinarily moral people. Um, you look at the conversations people have. I was just at a conference, and there's always gossip. And it's always moral. Can you believe how he treats his students? Can you believe uh, after her husband died, she started dating so soon? What do you think of what this person's doing? And this concern about being good. And I think if you, if you look at yourselves and look at, at other people, if it turns out that something you're doing gives you pleasure, but you're persuaded that it makes the world worse, increases the suffering of others, I think almost everybody would say, I don't want to do that. I want to get pleasure, but I also want to help people. And this is particularly true when the people are, are those we love. You think about, about your children, your, 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 your parents, your siblings. You typically want to make their lives better. You don't just want to feel better. So I think the book is assuming there's, that people want to be good, but I think it's a safe assumption. It is, probably. The question is, isn't it the story about being moral and the story about morality that matters? So we care more about altogether believing that something is good and don't like to look whether it really is good. It is true that we might have a moral motivation, but we do have other motivations, and sometimes people are reluctant to look closely. Sometimes people give to charities, and they don't even want to hear if the charity is effective because it's a compelling charity and it looks good, and if they hear it's not effective, they would be frustrated. They want the story. They don't want the actual morality. But again, I think... They want both. I think that, um, that some people are sometimes willing to be deceived or self-deceived. But in general, part of the capacities we've evolved with, and I've studied babies and young children, I think this shows up very early, is a genuine concern for others. You, you mentioned in the book also that there's kind of current trends arguing against humans even even being able to make rational decisions and rational decisions that are moral, so where does that, why are you convinced that we are intelligent enough to make these conscious decisions? Well, I think, I, I mean. Well, they are, but maybe some. <laughs> oh, oh, I see, <laughs> I see. Um, I've, I'm not saying you agree with me, maybe you don't, but you understand the argument. You understand that sometimes uh, you, if I tell you, for instance, Empathy uh, causes you to care a lot more about somebody who's attractive, well, all of you, um, versus someone who's unattractive. You would say, well, that's not very good. I'd rather, I want to be more, more fair. I've talked about the ideas in this book to a lot of audiences. I've talked to people who are, who are not educated in, in the usual way. I've spoken to 12-year-olds at schools about this. And people disagree with me. They say, oh, you this and this. It's totally reasonable. But I've never met anybody who didn't understand, who wasn't capable of using reason. I've never met anyone who says, who says, yeah, you know, it's better to save 100 people than one person. And so I think we all have the capacity for reason. I think if there's one sin of psychologists, it's, I think, underestimating uh, our, our, the human capacity for logic and rationality, for thinking that we're slaves of the emotion and ignoring the fact that we're capable of doing what we're doing now, getting together in a room, listening to strangers, having discussions, and so on. And that's, that's a really terrible thing to, to, to ignore. Maybe you just need empathy as kind of a transmission, as a help for the most people to make them do kind acts. Religion as an example. Yeah. I don't doubt that empathy could be used to motivate people to do kind acts. I decide that it's really good to help these people over there. And as a way to persuade others, I, I tell a story about them, about look at their suffering, feel their pain. But the problem for relying on, relying on that is that empathy is a tool. And people who want other people to do terrible things will also use empathy as a way to prod them. So in some way, the book is... Um, 
almost a consumer protection book, hmm. which is that, that there are people all around you, politicians, demagogues, and everything, and they will be talking to you, and at one point they will say, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you, there's a little girl, blah, 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 and this terrible thing happened to her, and they did it, and at that point you should say, I know what you're doing. You're using my, my empathy to circumvent my reason, to motivate me. And sometimes people will do it for a good cause, but sometimes people won't. But isn't that the thing that matters, whether it's for a good cause or not? Because I have the same reaction like you do. But on the other hand, if, if a politician manages to, to mobilize people to a good cause, one that is rationally good as well, isn't that a good thing? It can be used in a good way. Racism can be used in a good way. If there's a war that a country should get into, if there's people who should be just uh, war punished, ideas. you could adjust, you could tell you could use people's racism, their fear, their hatred, their anxiety to motivate them. And politicians do this all the time. Mm -hmm. And like empathy, sometimes they could do it for a good cause. The problem is, to the extent we're autonomous reasoning beings, we don't want to leave. We don't want to leave these, these decisions up to other people. We don't want to be manipulated in that way. I think that, that in a democratic society, we all want to sort of nurture the capacity to judge for ourselves and to be very conscious of manipulative tools, even though I would agree sometimes these manipulations could be used for a good cause. What you say is very much an enlightenment view of, of human beings. It is. What we hear nowadays goes in a different direction. We hear that we are um, steered by algorithms, we're just machines reacting on some automatic impulses. And um, I wonder, this is a personal view of you, do you think that your side will win over the next few years? Or I think we might be at a crossroads there. I think my side is going to lose over the okay. next few years and win over the next several hundred years. Mm -hmm. I have a long view. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there, is, there is a sort of, even as we get more and more, some of the picture of humanity you say is true. I think to some extent we are, we are physical things. We are, are material creatures. We, our thoughts are not governed by, by immaterial spirits, but rather physical brains, of which we're going to hear more about. Um, But at the same time, we're plainly capable of reasoning and deliberation and conscious mulling over things. To deny that would be to deny the experiences of everybody in this room. Everybody in this room, when facing a problem, including a moral problem, should I loan money to that person? How should I deal with my child in this way? Who should I vote for? Struggle with it. We don't just reflexively choose. We argue. We debate. Sometimes our minds are changed. And I think that, and, and I think this is an argument that Steven Pinker has made. The moral progress we've seen over the last several hundred years, for instance, regarding the treatment of, of women, of ethnic minorities, um, of sexual minorities, the profound progress, was the, the gay pride parade yesterday, um, which would be unthinkable when I was a child, is, is evidence that we are capable of reason and evidence we are capable of moral improvement. And you argue, and, and that's crucial, I think, that this is due to rationality and not enlarged empathy or better capabilities to empathy, right? I think we are the same feeling creatures we were 50 years ago and 500 years ago. I think just as science has improved, as reason builds upon reason builds upon reason, the same thing has happened in our moral lives. So we are much better people in so many ways than our grandparents were when they were our age. Um, but it's not because we're, we're naturally more feeling, we're maybe less feeling in some ways, but because we've benefited from moral deliberation and thought. When, when we look at politics, we see now in, in several countries, again, very uh, populist movements. And yes. I wouldn't separate on which political side they come from. It's just something that's, that's, that's been rising. And what I found astonishing is that, that you kind of say politics is, is not the field to discuss this. You say that the people don't care about truth because for them it's not really about truth, politics. You compare it to sports. And 
that kind of, to me, ditches the ball to stay with sports because this is actually the field where it is most urgent to, to discuss this topic, whether politicians should seduce people, are seducing people more than they used to, whether we should apply to rationality. You usually get um, people tell you you're cynical when you say politics have to be rational. Yeah. No, um, when, when this book came out, this, this book has had many covers, and yeah. when the hardcover came out in England, yeah. my publishers wanted to put a, a picture of a sad dog in front. And okay. I had no idea why. And they say, yes, no, why? the British love sad dogs. Oh, yes. And, and, but but I, <laughs> that, said, that I said no. You. And I said no because I actually want politicians to read it. I want it to sort of change how we approach mm -hmm. politics. So that's my goal. My observation, which you were entirely correct, is that a lot of people, when it comes to politics, particularly national politics, it brings out our worst instincts. Because, because there's no practical cost in my own life for who I vote for and who I argue and what I put on Twitter. Um, it's not like interacting with my children or planning my budget, which really want to get things right. Because there, people tend to care a lot about in-group versus out-group, uh, signaling their virtue, uh, protecting their reputation. And it takes a lot of, in some way, discipline to realize politics isn't, supporting your political party isn't like su supporting your sports team. You should approach it differently. But I was observing many people don't. But don't you think it should be possible to do it? Yes. Okay. It is. <laughs> and and, and I'm, I'm optimistic. I mean, it is true there's, there's a rise of populist movements, but we have also had leaders uh, at, at different stages who are capable of sort of struggling through making choices based on facts, making Who, who would you think of? There's somebody coming to mind right away? Well, for me, I mean, this is an American example. For me, okay. Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. so, so whatever one thinks about Obama's politics, um, he was always portrayed as, as, as a deliberator. He'd always understand both sides. He'd often describe the other side, and he'd say, these are the positions we should take. And again, you might agree or disagree with him, but relative to the current American president, Obama really did take a lot of rationality into account. But finally, he was a, a perfect example of somebody using stories and appeal yes. to empathy to convince people. And he was actually what is, is not very often discussed. He was, he was the one who started the, the social media influencing, the very empathic pathos campaigns. So what, what do you make of that? I think a successful politician has to do both. I think a successful politician, to be, actually be good at his or her job, has to be a rational liberator. To get elected, they have to be good at tweaking our, our emotions and telling stories. I sometimes talk to journalists, and sometimes journalists listen, and sometimes at the end of the discussion, journalists will say, look, OK, let's be honest here. Are you trying to put me out of a job? <laughs> Are you trying to just say we should base our decisions based on statistics? Because I'm a journal. I tell you stories. I work in stories. And my answer is, stories are great. I, I told a st one or two stories when giving a short presentation. Stories are great. But stories should be, once you've laid out the argument based on sort of objective data, then you could tell your story to, give, to make it vivid, to make it understandable. But what a demagogue does, what an irrational person does, is there's only the story. There's, only the, there's a story which you hear a lot in the United States saying, these people have suffered at the hands of illegal immigrants. That's my story. Now we should expel illegal immigrants. And they don't ask, well, do illegal immigrants commit more crimes than native-born citizens? They do not, and stuff like that. Why has it, why has it become acceptable to, to talk about subjective truths? There is a lot of talk about now that, that President Trump has, has even made that more possible. But it started about I would say 15, 20 years ago, that people started saying on TV, well, it might not be true, but it feels true for the people. So that's what matters. It's a good question. It, it's one of these rare cases where the extreme right wing and the extreme left wing find common cause. So you're right that, that you know, Trump and many people in his administration would talk about you know, their facts and other people's facts and so on. And there'd be a subjectivity about truth. Well, often on the extreme left, people would say, look, truth is what we make of it. If we feel it's this way, it is this way. Um, but I think that these are actually both minorities. I think most people realize for many things there's a fact of the matter. 
and we could investigate, we could figure out what it is. It may be hard to figure out, but most people are what philosophers would call realists about truth. And, you know, for some things, that they're, 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 there's a reality to them which, which we could figure out. And I think most people, including most philosophers actually, are moral realists too. Um, it's not merely our opinion that the Holocaust was a terrible thing. It's not merely our opinion that discriminating on the basis of skin color is wrong. There's actually grounded reasons to come to these moral conclusions. And again, as sort of contemplative people, we could do that. Let's see what the audience thinks. Are there any questions for Paul at this moment? Uh, yes. They always tell me in Switzerland, nobody's going to ask questions. It's not true. <laughs> He was first. The uh, the Herr in the second row. Genau. Um, thank you for the talk. You you mentioned Barack Obama as a good example, and one of the things he did when he said, "What would he recommend to people if a good gift a gift to humanity is more empathy?" Mm -hmm. And I remember Nicholas Epley's book Mindwise, where he tore into that and took that apart, saying it's actually inaccurate. So. Yeah, um, yes, thanks for uh, catching me on that. <laughs> it's, uh, yes, oh, I, I, I begin one of my, I have my book and also one of my articles listing all of the politicians, both left and right, say the one thing the world needs is more empathy. But Obama was quite clear, and in fact, he actually clarified this later on, that by empathy, he didn't mean we should feel experiences of others or zoom in. He meant kindness. He meant compassion. He meant uh, valuing the lives of other people. And that's something I'm, I'm fully behind. I mean, in some way, you, you're making a good point. The terminology trips us up, because there's no word for what I'm talking about that everyone would agree on. Maybe a better way of looking at it is that, um, that if we didn't value others, uh, we wouldn't be kind in the first place. And you could call that empathy. But we should avoid the sort of narrowness and bias and try to sort of do think in a broader, more rational sense. And although Obama might have used the word empathy to describe something that, that, that sounds like it disagrees, there's still a congruence. I think he meant compassion. Yes. And then the lady next, yeah. My question is about babies. You said these things uh, appear early in life. Could you tell us a bit how, how early in life actually babies uh, show compassion and empathy and, and how it develops over the first years of life? It's a great question. Um, a lot of people will say to me, well, you know, maybe you're right about empathy in adults, but if you didn't have empathy feeling the pain of others, you'd never be a good person. And I think this is mistaken. I think developmental psychology shows it's mistaken. It's mistaken in two ways. One way, and this is actually right to the work of Simon Baron Cohen, is that people who have autism or on the autistic spectrum are characteristically very low in empathy, down to the standard empathy test, yet they're often very good people. They're far more likely to be the victims of cruelty than the perpetrators, and it's because they don't lose their compassion and their sense of care. The second strand of evidence comes from research that I've done with my colleagues. Um, very young children at about the age of one um, actually don't show that much empathy in a sense of resonating the pain of other people. What they do show early on is a desire to help, a compassion. If they see, somebody, if they see another baby crying, they might reach out and soothe the baby. Um, if they see, and there's all these anecdotes about them, them soothing people and helping people and so on. But they do that before they start resonating to the pain of others. If there's a developmental progression, it's sort of kindness, compassion first, and then empathic responses later. And I think the story of empathy in the end is actually going to be an interesting story that might be disconnected to morality. Some people have argued, for instance, that we've evolved empathy um, not as a mechanism in general to be kind to each other and so on. Compassion does that but more for actually parenting and childcare, for sort of a connection between mothers and fathers and their babies. Thank you very much for a very nice talk. I did like your points. I don't like your title, I guess. <laughs> and so my problem is that if, if your title was being aware that empathy can be used against you, mm -hmm. I would like this point because 
you know, I agree with you that maybe we're all victims. Maybe sometimes people are trying to, to manipulate us. But, you know, I'm, I'm a young academic and I have PhD students and postdocs. And so, you know, some of them have panic attacks and some of them lose their family during their PhDs. And if I have no experience with these feelings, if I cannot relate to them, then I won't be able to ever help them. I won't be able to understand them. And as a result, they won't have the opportunity to become better scientists. And, you know, they would be more competitive with each other while... Yeah. And so for me, using empathy, and maybe, maybe you're right, maybe I am using empathy. And you're also right that I feel a better person when I'm successful at, at feeling empathy. But I actually think it could be used in a very positive way and it makes all of us better. So my question is, if you could click a button, would you eliminate empathy? I like your question. Um, I talk. I don't talk about that specific case in my book, but I talk a lot about therapy and what a, what a good therapist, a psychiatrist, a psychologist needs. And I think it extends to your case as well and anybody who works with other people. So let me give the case. I won't even use the word empathy because it, the word doesn't matter. Let's talk about the ideas. Suppose you're dealing with a student or a postdoc who has panic attacks. And, um, and this is getting in the way of his or her success, and it's just making their lives miserable. What should you do? Well, you're exactly right. You should try to understand what's going on with them. If you don't understand what's going on with them, you're not going to be good at helping. You, you might think it's, you, you'll just get things wrong. Understanding is critical. But you shouldn't be feeling what they're going through as you're dealing with this. And in fact, this is the standard way I distinguish empathy from compassion. I'm, you're dealing with a student who's extremely anxious and upset. What do they want from you? They don't want you to be extremely anxious and upset with them. They don't want you to adopt their point of view at the moment. What they want is support, understanding, and calmness. And this is a point, it's not original to me, it's a point made by Cicero. Cicero says that when we're miserable, we don't want a friend to become miserable. We want a friend to kind of help cheer us up and understand us. When we are anxious, we don't want a friend to be anxious. We want one to be calm. And so the treatment of the people you work with, what they, what they need is understanding and, and you valuing them, you caring for them, which you obviously do. But they don't need you to resonate with them. They don't need you to catch their feelings, whatever one calls that. First, the lady in the back. Yes, oh, there's actually three ladies in the back. Daya, yeah, diagonal, you know. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask about the definition of empathy and what you understand um, under that word and um, whether understanding someone's point of view necessarily makes you want to feel with them. Hmm. It's a good question. Again, People use the term empathy in different ways. And, and, but the answer to your question is, is no, it doesn't. Suppose I'm, um, suppose I'm a military commander, and there's an enemy general, and I want to know what he's, what he's up to. I want to figure, or, or suppose I'm a chess player, and I want to know what my opponent's thinking, or a poker player. Um, I'm going to want to understand them and know exactly where they're coming from and exactly what they're up to but not so I could adopt their own goals, but so I could defeat them. And so what you're talking about is, is sometimes called cognitive empathy. It's understanding. And I think understanding, as we talked about with the postdocs and the graduate students, is critical for doing good, but it's also critical when dealing with an enemy. And so there's a, a critical divide between understanding somebody and adopting their interests. Having said that, to some extent, I think, particularly with people who do terrible things, when you know more about what went on with them, when you have a better appreciation of them, it does make you a bit less harsh towards them. You could start to feel, to understand, if I was in their situation, maybe I would have done the same. And I think in that way, understanding does make us a bit better people. Hi. I'm reading a lot of articles lately about you should trust in your gut feeling. And I was wondering, even though it's such an irrational feeling, isn't it the point where you kind of can find the rationality and empathy and decide whether it's good or bad? So 
if I could put a billboard in every city in the world, what I would have the billboard say is, don't trust your feelings. <laughs> don't listen to your gut. Um, and I'm saying this to some extent as somebody who's interested in neuroscience and evolution. Our gut feelings are the product of biological evolution and cultural learning. And they're, they're, they're designed to guide us through life. And sometimes, if for social situations and so on, sometimes your gut will get, you, will get it right. But it, it's not there to do the right thing. My gut tells me that somebody who looks like me and speaks my language, their fate is much more important than somebody who looks very different and doesn't speak my language. My gut tells me the most important people in the world are my children and people I love and everyone else much less important. My gut, uh, if we looked at this audience 50 years ago, your gut would tell you that, um, that, that being gay is repellent and disgusting and wrong. And I think what moral progress often do involves is overriding your gut. So I called this book Against Empathy, but I could have well called it Against Gut Feelings in Morality. It's maybe it some of even better. it might have sold even better, yeah. Um, um, or it just don't listen to your heart. Yeah. Mm. Good, very good, very good. We have okay now. Yeah, she was first with the black T-shirt, then the lady here, and then was somebody on the left. Yes, yeah. Um, you mentioned theory of mind earlier, and I was wondering whether you see theory of mind and empathy as two separate components. Or if you see empathy as like a subcomponent of theory of mind, as it's often said to be like the um, emotional aspect kind of to theory of mind. It's a, bit, it's a very good question. It gets, it gets kind of deep. I, I see them as separate. So I would define theory of mind as the capacity to understand what's going on in other people's heads. To know that, you know, that, that you're angry at me, and when you say this, it means that you're thinking about this, and you're, you're paying attention to that, and so on. Um, and well, empathy is the sort of emotional connection. But you're quite right. In order to feel empathy for somebody, to experience the world as they do, to, to feel their pain, you need theory of mind. Because otherwise, how do you know what to feel? It's not as if, if you're in pain, it's not as if by magic your pain comes to me. If you're in pain, for me to know it requires looking at your face, listening to your voice, using theory of mind. So. Theory, emotional empathy of the sort I'm critical of re relies on theory of mind. Someone with no theory of mind could have no emotional empathy. Here in front, please. They were first. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what I wanted to say is that it sounds like partially you're in favor of empathy as long as you experience pleasure through others right okay I, yeah. and it becomes kind of a defensive <laughs> stance that empathy becomes bad when you're feeling not so good through others but i get your point of um not uh, not being used in a moral way uh, i think that's the main point of the discussion and it's not quite against empathy per se Right. I mean, a, a worse title for my book would be Against Empathy When It Comes to Moral Decision-Making and Moral Action. Um, and, but but did we mean, I, let me try to be more clear, which is that what I'm saying is empathy actually, uh, if somebody could st strip the human mind of empathy, I would say no. Because it's such a great source of pleasure. It's a pleasure of sex, a pleasure of sports, the pleasure of fiction. All involves experiencing the world as others experience it. And I think that's fine, but I just don't think we should use it to make moral decisions. And I feel that way about other emotions, too. Um, uh, um, sexual attractiveness, uh, feelings of lust, it's great, but it's a lousy way to make moral decisions. That's absolutely true, uh, I would agree. But um, is it not possible to be empathic uh, for a moment uh, enough to connect to others and then use our rationality to make uh, ultimate decisions. Yeah, I agree that we shouldn't make uh, decisions based on empathy because they're not ours in a sense. Um, but 
I believe it's possible to be empathic as long as it needs uh, or whatever for the the time it serves and then make a rational decision. Well, there's stu- so in a sense, I agree with you. Empathy is often involuntary. And so we feel powerful empathy. And, and sometimes we go on and put it aside and, and be rational. And then it didn't do any harm. But empath- feeling empathy always carries a risk. Suppose you're in a situation where you're having a dispute with the person next to you. And just for a second, I feel great empathy for you. And now I step back. But the problem is, I didn't feel empathy for the person next to you, or the other person, or 10 other people, or your community, or your family. I only felt empathy for you. And that's going to skew the balance. That's going to that's mean that my eventual decision, to the extent it had an effect on me, is going to be biased towards you. It's, it's no wonder that when people are trying to make a case where they want something, they want other people to be punished, they want resources, they feel my pain. Let me tell you what it's like to be me. And they do this because it gets the other person not to be objective and fair. So I think sometimes empathy could be is unavoidable, sometimes it could be harmless, but it never helps. Sorry for describing you in that way, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine with my glasses. Job. You have to describe people. Um, um, it seems to me, thank you also for the talk, uh, it seems to me that the crucial the, uh, distinction is between empathy and compassion. Um, isn't the thing that uh, empathy is there not just, as you mentioned already, to create a connection between parents and child, but isn't it a way to develop compassion, as probably as, as you said before, we need empathy to actually be able to have some compassion. And you pointed toward that babies already actually have compassion before they have empathy, but maybe isn't it about the ability to work in society and to connect to people which we probably would otherwise not have any compassion because, as you said, they are too far, they are too distant, they are too different. So I think that that's... A What you're outlining is a theory that many psychologists would say is correct. That empathy, although maybe we shouldn't rely on it making moral decisions, is sort of the seed from which compassion grows. And they might say, okay, maybe compassion comes first, but still, without empathy, compassion can't fully nurture. And I don't want to say it's wrong. I mean, I don't think there's evidence for it, but it might well be true. But I will tell you something about people right now, about adults. We can measure your empathy. There's tests for your empathy, um, some developed by my student, Matt Jordan. And and some of you are high empathy. If you saw somebody crying, you'd cry. If your laughter is infectious, you immediately zoom in on a person. And some of you are high compassion, which is you just care a lot about other people. As you live your life, you're caring about other people. You could be both, but you could also be one or the other. It turns out that empathy Compassion is highly predictive of good behaviors in laboratory experiments in the real world. Empathy is not. And Matt Jordan did this study where he he used about, I think, a thousand people who use Facebook and looked at their Facebook posts. And he found that people who were high in compassion, their Facebook posts use words like love, helping, friend, you know, hugging, happiness. And people who 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 were high in empathy had posts like misery, tears, hate, pain. Regardless of whether they sort of develop in sync, I'm skeptical, but regardless of that, as adults, high empathy actually gets in the way of being a good person. After I wrote this book, and again, a lot of people disagree with me reasonably enough, but some people wrote to me and said, "The, the distinction that I'm making helps people understand why they couldn't make it as doctors or emergency workers or social workers, because although they really wanted to help people, they loved people, wanted to help them, their pain was too intense. And the people who are best at those jobs actually are kind of cheerful, happy people, and they meet somebody who's having their worst day of their life, and it doesn't destroy them. It doesn't have much of an effect on them. The best people at helping people care a lot about other people, but in a sense of empathy we're talking about are, are not high and might well be low. 
So your, your development of speculation, I think, is, is open for discussion, but at least right now, the two are separable, and I think it's better regarding morality to be high in empathy than, than, than high, sorry, high in compassion, high in empathy. We can take two more questions, I'm afraid. Uh, yes, and then the lady in the back. Thank you. Um, do you have um, specific strategies in mind that might help us as individuals and as societies to extend compassion beyond our narrow tribe, beyond the in-group? Thank you. Oh, that's such, that's such a good question. Um, I don't have that many insights. I guess what I guess I would say, I would, I'll say something speculative and then say something more grounded. The speculative thing is there are arguments. I don't think the data is anywhere near this that mindfulness training and mindfulness meditation somewhat dampens emotional empathy and increases compassion. Now, I, there are scientists in this room, and I want to be cautious that, that there's studies showing this, but then there's arguments against it. But, but that's something that may pan out, and if so, it'll be a good answer for you. Um, I guess in general, this connects to some of the questions we talked about. What I'm more confident in is having a sort of culture. And the culture is a culture in which it's a culture of compassion, and a culture of neutrality and impartiality and rationality, as opposed to a culture of feelings. Right now, you know, even though we might instinctively favor our own race when it comes to resources and caring, we'd be ashamed to say so. And if we felt ourselves about to, to go that way, we'd say, oh, I don't want to think that way, I want to think another way. I'd like to do the same thing with empathy more broadly where we sort of say, yes, I'm very, I feel it's exactly right for me to give so much of my money to other Swiss people in need, <laughs> even though people in another country might need it more, and then step back, because we're, we're not, we're, we have time, and say, is that the best use of it? Will that make the world a better place? If so, go ahead, but if not, we should recognize that we're just being biased and try to defeat that bias. And so I, want, I can imagine a bigger cultural change happening. And some places work differently than others in that way. And one example of this is simply being skeptical of politicians who try to manipulate us in this way. One more question. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, so actually, I wanted to take that question a bit further. So we live in a world that is, at the moment, informationally dominated by very em emotionally charged disputes and very biasing opinions, especially in the political landscape, right? So uh, while I completely agree that more compassion and less empathy probably would be a good way to approach this, right? And uh, meditation and mindfulness could be a way to do it on practical sense. You cannot just go around and tell people, go meditate, go think critically, right? Do you have any kind of m practical way you think we, what could we do in order to actually get there? Thank you. I guess the most practical, so in some way I think you can tell people to do these things, so I'd be cautious about meditation. But here's my immediate practical take home message. And my answer is, I'm telling people to do this. Um, and my, my one immediate practical message is, beware of what I'm calling empathy traps. So, so the practical advice I will give, and, 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 and then tell your family and friends so that they do it too, and soon it will spread across the world, and they should buy my book as well, um, <laughs> is that when somebody says, let me tell you a story about somebody who is suffering, immediately ask yourself, what are, why are they trying to manipulate me in this way? If it's a good cause, let's hear the arguments for the good cause. But very, in, in, in modern politics, in the sort of hurly-burly of modern, modern politics, it often begins with your empathy for a victim, and it ends with, so we should throw these people out of the country, we should put these people in prison, we should, we should you know, kill these people. And so, being warned about empathy traps, being warned about empathy at its worst, is one immediate practical take home of the work I've been doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're gonna, we're gonna have a short break. Uh, short means 10 minutes. Uh, the bathrooms are just straight down the stairs and
please be back in about 10 minutes and welcome with me Sarah Jane Blakemore, who takes a different but nonetheless also very interesting approach to psychology.
Ladies and gentlemen, please slowly walk back to your places. Don't panic. The slides of the... Welcome back, everyone. Our next guest is here from the UK. Sarah Jane Blakemore is a professor in cognitive neuroscience at the University College of London, where she also co-directs a PhD program in neuroscience. She's a fellow of the British Academy, also a carrier of the Klaus J. Jacobs Research Prize from 2015. 2018, she got the Royal Society Prize for Science book. For this book, Inventing Ourselves, that we'll talk about today, The Secret Life of the Teenage Brain. Thank you very much, and welcome Sarah Chen Blakemore. Um, Right, I have no slides, uh, so I'm just going to talk about the teenage brain. So f uh, first of all, I want to start this talk with a, um, a letter that was written to the Guardian newspaper a few years ago. So this is a reader who wrote into the Guardian newspaper and said, there's nothing like teenage diaries for putting momentous historical events in perspective. This is my entry for the 20th of July, 1969. I went to Art Centre by myself in yellow cords and blouse. Ian was there, but he didn't speak to me. I got a rhyme put in my handbag from someone who's apparently got a crush on me. It's Nicholas, I think. Ugh. Man landed on moon. <laughs> and the reason this uh, uh, diary extract really nicely illustrates um, adolescence is because it shows that to this particular girl at this particular moment in her life, less important is the fact that man happened to land on the moon for the very first time that day, and more important are things like what she's wearing, who she likes, who she doesn't like. Adolescence is the period of life in which our sense of self-identity, and particularly our sense of social self, that is how other people see us, undergoes really profound transition. So if you think back to your own teenage years, um, it's things that characterize you to the outside world that take on a step change in importance. So things like your music taste, your fashion taste, the peer group you hang out with, who you like, who you don't like, even your moral beliefs and your political beliefs can take on and normally do take on 
a sudden increase in importance because this is the period of life in which you are trying to establish yourself amongst your social group. So how do you define adolescence? That is something that's actually not that straightforward. Often we define it as the period of life that starts with puberty. So the beginning of adolescence is defined biologically by the hormonal and physical changes of puberty. And the end of adolescence has a much more vague definition, which is the age at which you attain a stable, independent role in society. So it can go on quite a long time. <laughs> There are probably some of you who wonder whether they still fit this definition. And if you think about that defini definition, what's interesting is the very strong cultural differences between uh, the different ways um, different cultures uh, expect adolescents to behave and to function in society. So in our culture here in the West, it's completely socially acceptable to be in full-time education, to be living with your parents right throughout your teenage years and even into your 20s or maybe your 30s. But in other cultures around the world, that's not the case at all. And children are expected to become independent. So they're expected to earn their own money as soon as they can and to have babies as soon as they reach sexual maturity. Now, some people have argued that because of these very big cultural differences in the way we think of this age group, that adolescence, this term we use, is a recent Western phenomenon invented about 100 years ago by a psychologist in, in the US. And doesn't really, some people argue that adolescence doesn't really exist as a sort of biological period of development. But I think there are many reasons why that's not the case and why, in fact, adolescence should be considered as a unique period of biological, psychological, and social development. And I'll just uh, very briefly go over three pieces of evidence for this. First of all, if you look at adolescent typical behaviors, by which I mean behaviors which we stereotypically associate with this age group, so things like impulsivity, or heightened risk-taking, or self-consciousness, or peer influence, those kinds of behaviors you can see across cultures even in cultures where societal expectations of this age group differ vastly. In addition, across species, adolescence is not unique to humans, far from it. In fact, all species of animal undergo a period of life between uh, going through puberty and becoming fully sexually mature adults. And in that stage of development, you can measure behavior and you can see changes in behavior like risk-taking and impulsivity. There are many labs around the world that do this, and they mostly study adolescent development and adolescent behavior in, uh, in rodents, in mice and rats. Mice and rats go through about 35 days of adolescence. And in those 35 days, you can measure increases in risk-taking, increases in exploration of the environment, and very big changes in social behavior. There was one study published a few years ago showing that adolescent mice drink more alcohol when they're with other mice, but that's not the case for adult mice who drink the same amount of alcohol whether they're on their own or with their cage mates. Across history, now one of the things that I find interesting about adolescents <coughs> is how much we as a society demonize them and are very negative about them. That's nothing new as well. Across history, if you look at historical descriptions of this age group, you see striking similarities with the way we describe adolescence today and strikingly similarly negative. So I picked out a couple of examples just because they're very old. For one is from Socrates. So over 2,000 years ago, Socrates, he talks about youth, what he calls youth a lot, and he says things like they have bad manners, contempt for authority, they show disrespect for elders, and love chatter in the place of exercise. Aristotle as well spoke a lot about youth. He, he says things like they're passionate, they're irascible, they're apt to being carried away by their impulses. Youth is when people are most devoted to their friends. And he, he goes on for many, uh, many passages about this age group and mostly really quite negative. So there's nothing unique about adolescence in terms of our culture in the West, our species, or our, this moment in history. Adolescents have seem, seem to have always behaved the way we kind of stereotypically think of the, about them today. Now, I became interested in adolescence because I did a PhD and a postdoc on schizophrenia, which, as you might know, is a psychiatric condition that's characterized 
by symptoms like hearing voices inside your head and being really paranoid, thinking that other people are out to get you, that other people want to harm you. It's a very, very debilitating illness, and I tested many hundreds of patients uh, in hospitals, in psychiatric hospitals in the UK, and also in France, where I did my postdoc. And I became in interested in the fact that when I asked patients, when did you first start experiencing the, these symptoms, Without a single exception, every patient I tested said at some age between 18 and about 26 or 27. So I became interested in why. What is it about brain development during the teenage years that is different in teenagers who go on to develop schizophrenia compared with teenagers who don't go on to develop schizophrenia? Now, at the time, that was in the early 2000s, uh, when I looked at the scientific literature, to my surprise, there was virtually nothing known about how the, te the, the human teenage brain changes. We just didn't know. And in fact, going back a bit further, during my undergraduate degree, I was taught in my developmental psychology and my developmental neurobiology courses that the human brain stops developing in childhood. That was just about 22 years ago that I was taught that. And I know I was taught that because I kept my... Uh, textbooks from my undergraduate degree, and that's exactly what they say. Now, we know that that's completely not true. And in fact, the human brain continues to develop right throughout childhood and throughout adolescence into the 20s and even into the 30s. And we know that because over the last 20 years, we've been able to scan the living human brain of all ages using MRI scanning to track changes in brain structure and brain function across the lifespan. <clears throat> Many labs around the world do this and have been doing it for 20 years, and this has built a really rich picture of how the brain changes. It changes in many, many different ways. For example, the structure of the brain changes throughout development with uh, white matter increasing and grey matter decreasing during adolescence. There's a very substantial increase in white matter, uh, which uh, contains the tracts, that connect up different brain regions together, allowing them to communicate with each other. Uh, that increases uh, right throughout adolescence and even into the 20s and 30s. And at the same time, there's a very substantial and protracted decrease in gray matter, particularly in the cortex, the surface of the brain, and particularly in regions like the prefrontal cortex and the parietal cortex, which are brain regions that we use to make decisions, to plan, to uh, have self-awareness and to interact with other people. So these brain regions are undergoing really uh, substantial and protracted change right throughout uh, adolescence and into early adulthood. And we don't know very much about what's happening at a cellular level, but we have a pretty good idea based on animal studies and studies of post-mortem human brain tissue. And we think that the cellular changes that underlie these changes in gray matter and white matter in the human brain are uh, neurodevelopmental mechanisms that make the brain particularly plastic. What that means is they make the brain particularly able to adapt to the environment that it's growing up in. Now, the reason why that is important is because heightened plasticity in adolescence uh, might be one reason why this period of life is a period of vulnerability, vulnerability to negative environmental experiences, rendering it a period of vulnerability to, for example, the development of mental health problems. We know that 75% uh, of mental health problems develop before the age of 24, mostly during the period of adolescence. Uh, it also renders it a period of opportunity. Um, uh, uh, Heightened plasticity means that you're better able to learn and you might benefit particularly from things like uh, intervention and rehabilitation. Now, in the final minute, I'm going to tell you a bit about how understanding brain development during adolescence can also tell us a bit about uh, behaviour during adolescence. So one of the behaviours that, uh, that I think is really quite universal is, is uh, self-consciousness and particularly embarrassment in front of one's parents. Um, this is something that happens to most of us when we go through puberty and early adolescence. There are many anecdotes that I'm sure some of you have your own. Um, uh, one of my friends told me that before puberty, um, uh, what differentiated his children 
before and after puberty most was their levels of embarrassment, particularly in front of him. So before puberty, he said that if they were messing around having an argument in a supermarket, he would say, stop messing around and I'll sing your favourite song. So they'd instantly be quiet and he'd sing in public. After puberty, that became the threat. The idea, <laughs> the idea that their dad would sing in public was enough to make them behave. Another friend of mine um, bought some bright blue uh, sneakers uh, which his 14-year-old son asked, asked him whether he bought them off the midlife crisis shelf. <laughs> and his two teenage sons banned him from wearing the, the, his trainers in the entire village in which they go to school. <laughs> um, we have an idea that uh, 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 the brain is activated differently and there are physiological differences like... Um, it, it, to stress levels, which you can measure by measuring the amount of sweat on your hands, when adolescents think they're being watched, um, compared with when adults or children think they're being watched. That's a series of studies by Leah Somerville at Harvard. So there, there might be a sort of biological reason uh, for why adolescents feel particularly self-conscious. I'm most interested in uh, social development in adolescents and the fact that uh, if you think about things like risk-taking, we worry about the risks that adolescents take, like smoking and binge drinking and taking drugs. Those are risks that adolescents don't tend to take when they're on their own, but instead they take them with other people, with their friends in particular. And many, many studies have shown that adolescents are particularly susceptible to peer influence. Uh, we think this might be because they, it's particularly important to adolescents to be included by their peer group, included by their social group, that um, being excluded by their social group results in uh, very negative feelings for all of us, adults as well, but more so for adolescents. And that, and this is my final point, uh, um, uh, sheds a more rational light on some behaviours that look, that appear to be irrational, like um, taking up smoking or binge drinking or whatever it might be in adolescents who know about the health risks of those things. Uh, but when they're with their friends, what's more important to an adolescent? Saying yes, for example, to a cigarette, even though they know the health risks, or saying no and potentially being ostracised by their peer group, well, we would argue that that social risk, the risk of social exclusion, weighs in more heavily to adolescent decisions. So, to conclude, um, the, the last 20 years has shown us that the teenage brain is undergoing a huge amount of change. We shouldn't think of the teenage brain as a broken brain or a defective or um, a strange adult brain. Quite the opposite, the adolescence is a formative period of life. Um, neural pathways we know are malleable during this period. Uh, creativity and passions are heightened. We shouldn't demonize this period of life. Instead, we should understand it and we should nurture it and celebrate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would first like to understand your research a bit better and then talk a bit about what we can learn for society or maybe education, about what you found out and your colleagues <coughs> about the teenage brain. You actually describe one study in your book where you looked at how the brain processes social emotions both in adults and teenage girls, adult women, teenage girls. And you took some embarrassment stories is what you call them, which were designed to be rebel relevant to girls and young women. One is, your dad started doing rock and roll dancing in the supermarket, or <laughs> you fell asleep on a train and dribbled on the person next to you. Ooh. <laughs> so what were you hoping to find out with these studies, and what did you find out about the brain? Yeah, okay, so... Uh, that was a series of studies which were carried out by one of my uh, former PhD students, Stephanie Bennett, who now runs her own lab in, uh, in, a, in a different university in the UK. Um, and we were really interested in uh, social emotions. So social emotions are defined as or can be defined as emotions that require um, an understanding of someone else's mind. So social emotions are emotions like guilt and embarrassment in order to feel guilty or embarrassed you normally have to think about how someone else would feel about you as a consequence of your action. Whereas to feel scared or, or angry, you don't need to think about someone else's emotions or, or mind. Um, and when you compare activity in the brain, when you're thinking about 
um, scenarios that evoke a little, a little feeling of embarrassment or guilt, like those ones, um, compared with uh, scenarios that evoke feelings of fear or disgust, say, um, you see activity in what we know, what we know, uh, what we call the social brain network, and the social brain network is made up of about four brain regions. It's very consistently activated. <clears throat> whenever you think about other people's minds or their emotions, and it's activated by social emotions for that reason. Uh, that's in adults, and there have been lots and lots of studies done on uh, social, the social brain and social emotion processing in the brain in adults. But what we found was that when we compared social emotion processing in adolescents to adults, uh, one part of the social brain network, which is called dorsal medial prefrontal cortex right at the front, is more active in adolescents than it is in adults, when they do exactly the same task, just thinking about social emotions. Now, what's interesting is that there are now about 10 other studies that have shown exactly the same thing. When you get adolescents to do some kind of social task that involves thinking about other people's minds, this part of the social brain network is activated in adults as well, but it's more activated in adolescents. So there's a real consistency with that finding. And uh, <clears throat> we don't know why, one of our main hypotheses which we're looking at at the moment is it might be that uh, adolescents and adults use different cognitive strategies or mental approaches to solve these problems. It's not that they find them harder, they don't. There's no evidence that they don't do as well on the task, in those kinds of tasks. But maybe they're using a different strategy. Like maybe it's more, once you become an adult, thinking about other people's minds and social emotions is more automatic, for example. You also wrote that it could be that they kind of imagine what situations could be <coughs> like rather than draw back on, on situations that they have already experienced, right? Yeah, so maybe uh, adults have accumulated so many different social experiences that they just roll them off, you know, they just roll them off automatically. They have all these different social scripts for a whole variety of different social situations, whereas by the age of, you know, if you're an early adolescent, 12, 13, 14, you haven't had so many social experiences yourself, so you, you have to do a more of a kind of rational... Um, calculation of what might happen in that situation rather than relying on your own experience or something similar. So would that mean that teenagers have more fantasy? <coughs> um, mm, well, I think that's a bit of a different question, but okay. actually, I interestingly, <laughs> um, there is some evidence from Evelina Crohn's group in Leiden that, yes, they do, <laughs> and that adolescents... Um, <laughs> think more creatively about situations than adults do. You can test this on various different slightly strange creativity tasks where you have to think of weird endings to stories or, or strange links between different words and adolescents tend to be more creative than adults. And I mean, that's, sci that's scientific findings published in scientific uh, journals. But I think that makes sense. If, you, if any of you work with uh, a range of ages, as I do, it's often the youngest people in the group who have the most creative interpretations of data or creative ideas for new experiments. And are they not taken seriously because they're seen as dysfunctional? That's well, I take them seriously. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, what I also learned from your book, interestingly, is that the famous marshmallow test has been repeated at least part of the with part of the sample when these kids were grown, so the marshmallow test, uh, I'm sure most of you know it, was looked at four-year-olds, I think it was, whether they could sustain, keep themselves from eating a marshmallow for a certain while and would then get more marshmallow to eat. And uh, that showed to correlate with later life success in different dimensions. Yeah, believe it or not. But that's probably because, um, so delaying gratification, these uh, three, four-year-olds were told to not eat the marshmallow that was right in front of them for 15 minutes while the experiment went out of, Very the, long went out of the room. And there were secret cameras filming them, and they did everything like sit on their hands so that they didn't grab the marshmallow, look away from it. Some of them did eat it. There were lots of individual differences. Some of them licked it, and some of them ate it. And they measured the amount of time these um, young children could wait before eating the marshmallow. Some of them got to the end, the 15 minutes, in which case, as they were told, they would get an extra marshmallow for waiting. So that was like delicious delaying gratification of a bigger reward. Now, why? I mean, it's not about marshmallows. It's about what cognitive mechanism that 
paradigm is tapping into and it's probably some form of self-regulation or self-control which is we know is so important um, throughout life so they followed up a lot of those children as they got older and they showed that the um, the ability to delay gratification, so the, the length of time the children could wait for the second marshmallow, uh, um, correlated with things like, or predicted things like educational attainment and all sorts of other positive outcomes. So that was that one experiment by Walter Michel, but, but other experiments have been, or other studies have shown exactly the same thing. So for example, Terry Moffat, um, uh, who has who works on the Dunedin study, which is um, a study of a very large number of um, people in the in the area of Dunedin in New Zealand who've been followed since birth. They're now about almost 50, I think. Um, she's shown exactly the same thing that measures of self-regulation in childhood predict all sorts of positive outcomes from everything from um, educational attainment from to salary to the likelihood of being. Uh, in caught in the in the um, in the criminal justice system, and there's something really fundamental and positive about self-regulation. And it seems that in this regard, <coughs> uh, scientists have found out that the two systems, the limbic system, that's the really emotional, uh, animal <coughs> part of the brain, and the prefrontal cortex, don't develop in the same pace in the average person. There's individual differences, it seems. And that would then be important for the teenage brain, right? Because some people would have a developed prefrontal cortex and others wouldn't. Yeah, so the idea here is that one idea, a very prominent idea, is that the limbic system, which is in the center of your brain, uh, contains regions like the amygdala, which processes emotion, and the nucleus accumbens, which processes reward, which gives you a really positive feeling out of, say, taking a risk, uh, develops before the prefrontal cortex, which I mentioned earlier. It's one of the regions of the brain that enables you to, amongst other things, it enables you to inhibit inappropriate behavior and stop yourself taking risks. So the idea here is that your, your limbic system, which is giving you emotions and giving you a kick out of taking risks, is already mature before the ability to inhibit risk-taking, and that explains heightened risk-taking in adolescence. It's a really nice theory. It's actually been hugely critiqued over the last 10 years <laughs> uh, as being too simplistic, not least because there are massive individual differences. That's a study that we, we ran with Kate Mills, my former PhD student, who's now uh, an assistant professor in Oregon. Uh, she, she looked at the... Um, yeah, she looked at how these two regions of the brain develop expecting to see that in in you know in young adolescents um the limbic system to be fully mature and the prefrontal cortex still to be changing in fact the main finding from that study was the enormous individual differences some people's limbic system is out of kilter with their prefrontal cortex others isn't and the key question is why i mean that's something a lot of people are now becoming really interested in individual differences in adolescents some adolescents take loads of risks other adolescents are very risk averse uh, brain, the brain develops in very different ways in different adolescents. Why? What is it about the genetics or the environment, for example, the culture or the socioeconomic environment, your nutrition, your exercise, all these different environmental factors? How do they contribute to the development of your brain and your behavior in adolescence? Could, could that explain what, what would we call in everyday life early developers and late developers, some that are just not mature when they're 18 and take 10 more years to mature? Could be, could be, and the answer is we don't know because okay. these, if you think about it, the studies that you'd need to do would need to follow people for 10 years and ask them all sorts of questions about um, m you know, risk-taking and, ma and maturity and also track their brains, and we haven't been able to do that yet, but that study... Is, is now being done in America. There's a very big study called ABCD, which stands for Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study, where they're tracking brain and behavior and hormone and genetics um, uh, measures from 12,000 children aged 9 to 10 uh, over the next 10 years, and they'll be able to ask that question exactly. Oh, very interesting. When will the results be out? Oh, well, they're, they're starting to come out already, yeah. because what's really interesting, if anyone is interested in this um, is that this is completely open access so this is a sort of new dimension of um, of in my area of science this push which by the way interestingly has really come from the bottom up it's come from the early career researchers this push for open science this idea that data our data should be open to anyone to analyze and the ABC 
the project data are open access. They're all, the first wave is already freely available to anyone who asks for it and, uh, and tells them why they want it. Uh, and people have started not only to analyze it, but there are already papers coming out on it. Very good. Well, let's talk a bit before we open up for the audience about what your findings and the findings of your colleagues could mean for the school system. That um, <coughs> you mentioned several times also in the book that it's really important to take teenagers seriously, to take adolescent brains seriously, to, to think about what kind of conditions they need to learn. So what do you know in that respect? What could you advise teachers? Um, like I said, this field is pretty young. You know, this field really has only been around for, well, 20 years, but m largely in the last five and ten or ten years have we learned a, a great deal about the adolescent brain. So it's already quite young, and it's probably too young to draw very strong conclusions about how to change the classroom, how to change teaching uh, for adolescents on the, as a result. But I think there are a couple of uh, there are a couple of things we can draw from it. Firstly. Um, a lot of adolescents find it really useful to know about how their brains are changing. It, it's useful because adolescence for some people can be a really difficult time, a time of a turmoil and change and transition. And uh, this is when things like um, it's quite normal to develop sort of rumination, thinking negative thoughts a lot. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we, we've all been there and it, it, we might, you might remember that yourself. It's sometimes not an easy time to go through. So knowing about how the brain is changing and how these changes are natural and adaptive could be quite useful, mm -hmm. especially if you look, if you see, you know, sometimes it's really useful. Not that I showed any slides, but sometimes it's really useful to visualize these things and to see how the brain is changing so much. But then it does stabilize. So and that's the t t you know, general pattern, these things do stabilize eventually. So I know it, it gets better. It gets better. <laughs> and also, there is one area of neuroscience which I think probably does have implications for, um, for schools, which is about the circadian rhythm, the body clock. So we know that um, uh, from animal research and also human research that um, the circadian rhythm shifts at puberty such that uh, after puberty, um, uh, melatonin which it in in humans is the hormone that the brain produces uh, in response to dark at night and it makes you feel sleepy um, and we know that melatonin production in the brain happens about two hours later after puberty and th throughout the next 10 years in humans um, compared with in childhood or adulthood and that means that teenagers find it quite hard to go to sleep early in the evening now that's why they're awake in the evening and also it they find it hard to get up in the morning it's not the only reason they also have a you know new social life new um uh, academic and non-academic commitments and everything gets shifted a bit later um but that that the fact that part of it is biological some people have argued has implications for what time child, um, young people should start school in the morning because effectively we get them up in the middle of their night and make them go and do a maths or physics lesson or whatever and maybe that's not quite in line with their biological development but of course um, we also have to think about society and it's not just a question of making schools in line with biological development but also we have to think about things like the fact that parents go out to work and they may not want to leave their teenager in bed mm -hmm. and hope hoping that they'll wake mm -hmm. up in time and get themselves to school as they usually won't yeah <laughs> yeah thank you very much i think we'll open up at mm -hmm. this point for the audience are there any questions for sarah jane Maybe somebody who's raising teenagers right now. Yes. Info. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, one question I have is um, what's important is to learn how other people feel about you and get the sense of identity. And so recently, Google's DeepMind has not only beaten the best chess player in the world, the best uh, Go player in the world, but is also uh, won the best multiplayer games because it has a theory of mind of other people and could also conceivably make itself the most popular in a group. Could you see that one could use something like that to actually uh, learn these things at an accelerated pace? Yeah, I mean, there's no reason why not. Um, um, it, w w one of the things we're interested in is training these things. Can you, can you um, help teenagers become better at, for example, self-regulation, given that we know self-regulation is a really important thing. Uh, social cognition as well. Can you, can you um, improve perspective-taking or theory of mind 
in, in young people. And there's no reason why you have to do that via real humans. You could also do that via machines. So the research on the teenage brain development has had tremendous con consequences in the criminal justice systems, in particular in the US. And I heard a few doubts uh, in, in your presentation. Do you think these consequences were like premature and actually not justified by the research that was quoted? You can explain this much yeah. better than I can. Yeah. Um, no, actually, no, I don't think that. I think that was really quite early on in the research as well. So this, for example, the criminal justice system in the US in particular, but also recently a bit in the UK, and I don't know about other European countries, has become interested in, the f in this research. Not surprisingly, this research ha has got relevance for how we treat juveniles in the criminal justice system. Um, it in the US, the first time that this research, brain research on the teenage brain was used in, the, in, in criminal justice was in 2005, um, there was a Supreme Court inquiry into the death penalty for minors. By the way, before 2005, the death penalty was given to minors and quite a few, I think something like 26 minors were given the death penalty uh, between 1970 and, and 2005. But on the basis of a lot of evidence, including um, evidence from neuroscience and particularly driven by Larry Steinberg, who's one of the major researchers in this area in the US, um, they changed that. So they, they, uh, they, made, they made it illegal, federally illegal, to um, give the death penalty to, to minors. That, I mean, <laughs> you don't need a lot of evidence I would say, to argue against the death penalty for minors. That's fine, even though it was very early on in, in, um, in, in the science. Um, now, there, there are... Uh, so, you know, that's quite a harsh... big question about a harsh penalty. So now there are more nuanced questions um, about more nuanced laws. And there it does become tricky, because although I think this uh, evidence is relevant... It certainly shouldn't be the only thing taken into account in, in, in making these in making these laws. So, for example, um, uh, one of the things that the head of the criminal justice system in the UK is interested in is the fact that uh, if you, if someone commits a crime in a group, this is I don't know about any other laws, but in the UK, if someone commits a crime in a group, their punishment is harsher than if someone commits the same crime on their own. Now, that goes against what we know and we really do know a lot about social influence in adolescents, how adolescents are particularly influenced by when they're in a group of friends. Um, and perhaps for very good adaptive reasons, for perhaps they're really not very uh, good at controlling that in the heat of the moment. They go along with their friends because the drive to be accepted by the peer group is so strong. And yet it's exactly the opposite of the punitive system in the UK. So that, that kind of question is currently being debated, but it's not a simple question to answer and certainly shouldn't be answered just by cognitive neuroscience and experimental psychology. Thank you. More questions? Yes, here. Yeah. And then two rows behind. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I've done a little bit of um, that neurofeedback stuff for the last 20 years. Um, I've made a lot of observations, and I think right now at this point I've observed that many people, including adults, are suffering from low self-esteem. And you talk about self-regulation, which is neurofeedback. What it does is helping people to self-regulate. And there was just an article the other day about they're saying that the brain is developing very quickly between, between ages one and three. Um, but I find what's happening is that the, a lot of the people are lacking um, you know, self-esteem, which is you know, an independence is, and I've talked to other people, that today a lot of parenting is done through guilt and shame. So it doesn't encourage independence, which doesn't encourage self-regulation. And I think that if people would get to the, the teenage years, is that they would have more ability not to control. And I don't like to use the word control, because when you have control, you have expectations. So there's a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, and so on. Is that would it be possible if they were had better parenting which I think there isn't a lack of today, uh, would there be better developed brains? It's a really good question. How do you um, inject self-esteem into people, into children? And I mean, it's the million dollar question. We don't know the answer to it. Because if we did, we'd be, do it, we'd be doing that. Um, one, one thing, one uh, series of results that I think could be relevant are, the are, are a series of studies showing that adolescents... Um, 
learn better from reward than from punishment. So <clears throat> you can look at this in many different ways. I mean, I'm talking about very controlled experiments, so not learning in the classroom. I think we don't really know about that yet so much uh, from a scientific point of view, but learning um, associations between symbols, for example. Uh, ad adults learn equally well from reward, by which I mean payment, and punishment, by which I mean taking away payment. <laughs> um, uh, uh, adolescents only learn from reward and not from punishment. I think there's something really interesting there and something that we, in everyday life, you know, we, do, we don't... Um, uh, take, we don't take that into account at all. In, in schools and in, in parenting, we tend, our kind of instinct is to punishment, to, you know, take things away, to ground ch children and uh, young people if they do things wrong. But actually, maybe that doesn't really have very much effect on their behaviour, and we should be thinking about reward. And other, other series of studies have shown that um, it's immediate rewards, and particularly social rewards, that work better than long-term rewards. Do you have any clue as to why they react better to rewards? Um, no, but I think the, well not, not really, but I think the, um, there is quite a lot of evidence that um, immediate, immediacy is really important for adolescents. So one thing that develops across adolescents is the ability to, uh, of future thinking and to delay gratification. And so um, uh, immediate reactions, particularly positive reactions like reward, um, work better than some kind of promise of something in the future. Yes, uh, yeah. Hey, um, I'm curious about what does uh, neuroscience know about the impact of trauma on an adolescent brain? Um, yeah, so there is, I don't work on that, but lots of my colleagues do. And um, uh, so we know there's a lot of work on um, childhood trauma. Uh, in, in many different guises um, and the effect that has on the developing brain. So work, for example, by my colleagues at UCL, S.E. Veeding and Eamon McCrory have shown that um, childhood maltreatment affects the development of the brain, particularly emotional areas of the brain like the amygdala, and that uh, development continues in a different way throughout adolescence as well. So it has long-lasting effect on the brain's development. Um, similarly, um, uh, studies in Cambridge by people like in Ian Goodyear and Anna Laura van Hermelen have shown this, the same thing. And actually, one of their findings, which I think also might be relevant to your question about self-esteem somehow, is that um, uh, it is uh, it's about resilience. So what makes what makes some people resilient and other people unresilient to um, to adverse childhood events? And uh, Anna van uh, Anna Laura van Hermelen uh, a couple of years ago published a paper showing that. Um, the the biggest factor in determining resilience um, was the number no the the quality of friendship. So this is self self reported friendship quality in early adolescence. That was the factor that predicted resilience to mental health problems a year later more than anything else. The second factor was strong family relationships. But the but the interesting thing was the first factor was quality of um, self-reported quality of friendships. And it wasn't number of friendships, and it wasn't objective quality of friendships. It was just how you perceive your friendships in, in early adolescence. So I think that's something that also we should be thinking about. Probably don't think about enough how to um, support young people's friendships and relationships with their peers. Yes, there's yeah, first a person here, and then you two. Yeah, my question is also on the heels of the self-esteem one because that's uh, very much what my business is about as well. <coughs> and I've dis discovered that the more uh, aligned you are with your true self, the more authentic, the more sure you are, uh, the more real you are, the more you know yourself, you're actually less affected by what others think of you. And this is so interesting about adolescents. They're so affected by what others think of them. And I'm curious, as you do your research, what you learn about, especially in adolescents or even adults, the more they are true to themselves and don't actually look for the validation from others, whether or not this leads to a healthier, more uh, fulfilled person who's far less likely to be, you know, have mental uh, challenges or emotional. It's interesting. I think in, in some ways you've really... Um, 
pinpointed the sort of tensions around adolescence because I think that's probably true, but on the other hand, the whole point of adolescence is that you are building yourself. You don't really know what who you are at the beginning of adolescence. Um, and you spend a very long time gradually becoming independent from your parents and creating your self-identity. That's not to say that your self can't change after adolescence. Of course it can and often does. But adolescence is the period of life in which our sense of self undergoes huge amounts of development. So it's hard to know how adolescents can be true to themselves when that's in a period of flux and development and change. And maybe that's exactly why. I mean, maybe that's exactly why they're so um, uh, susceptible to peer evaluation and peer influence, because they're trying to work out what their friends think of them and where they fit in the social hierarchy and what is expected of them. And they have to be attuned to that. So it's a really adaptive uh, process. It's a really adaptive part of development to be very attuned. But it can go wrong. It can go wrong, and we see that on you know a lot with bullying. Bullying is peaks in early adolescence, and we know that bullying leads to really poor outcomes in terms if for the victim in terms of mental health. <coughs> it also uh, we see it in things like I mean I uh, I expect. Some of you are wondering about um, social media. I'm often asked about social media, but you know, s social media like Instagram or Facebook or whatever, that that taps into this need for um, social evaluation and um, uh, social acceptance in in a way that is that could be damaging for young people. There's people in the f in the back, and then one person here. Yes, I saw you. Good. Yep. Um, to what extent do you think it's possible to generalize what we know about adolescence to like the whole population? Because as you said, it's really like there's so many individual differences <coughs> due to extraneous variables from environmental factors that just are really difficult to be accounted for from the research that's been conducted. Yeah, it's a great question. I think that largely the, uh, the well, almost all the research that has been done so far in cognitive neuroscience is based on averages, average teenage brains compared with average adult brains. And that makes no sense at all because actually there is so much variation into individual variation and probably that carries much more meaning than the average. On the other hand, the average does tell you something. I mean, if you look at, um, if you look at how the brain develops, for example, in any... There have been many different cohort studies in uh, European and American European countries and in America, and they, if you take the average, they all develop in a remarkably similar way. So there's something very um, certain and robust about the way the brain changes during adolescence, no matter what country or city you're growing up in. Uh, so in some ways, the averages do tell us a lot, but they tell us something very crude. I mean, it's something new. We didn't know that 20 years ago. We do now. And now is the time, and that's why a lot of scientists are starting to look at individual differences. You know, some people's brains, although all teenagers that have been studied so far in European and Ameri uh, European countries in America, their brains develop in very similar ways. There are some differences, like some people's brains develop very steeply in early adolescence and then flatten out a bit in late adolescence. For others, it's the other way around. What does that mean? Uh, is it that m undergoing particularly steep development in early adolescence makes you more vulnerable to mental illness, for example? That's one question that's currently being looked at. And there are all sorts of other explanations for individual differences in brain development and also uh, for different outcomes of these different developmental trajectories. There was the, um, the woman just in front of her, she was first. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then the lady in the back um, Hello. with the well, white t-shirt, sorry. I've got two teenagers at home and the first, the, the older one is asking me whether I'm making no, it's questioning my moral, um, the morality of my educational decisions with the younger one, whether they are maybe more <laughs> empathetic or more compassionate. Uh, so now my question, I don't know if it's of relevance since you've said that um, individually the development can be so disparate. Um, so do boys differ from girls in the development? Ooh. So yeah, you have to get into that. <laughs> just a simple question. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank you for your answer. Um, 
Well, okay, that's interesting. So uh, there, are, there are not very many findings from cognitive neuroscience or developmental psychology of adolescents that show really robust differences between the genders in terms of the development in adolescence. Um, a lot of people have looked for them and they just haven't been very well replicated. That's not to say that there aren't differences between boys and girls. I mean, I think that there you know, there are, whether they're innate or cultural is a different question, but there, there are, uh, and particularly by adolescents. I think the, the reason we don't see them is firstly because the, although there are gender differences, the overlap between the genders is so enormous that in order to see the differences, you'd need really, really large numbers of people in studies, and we just don't have those kind of numbers normally. Um, but also because the, the tasks we use in experimental psychology are so kind of refined and and um, and controlled that I think maybe you they don't elicit these gender differences that you might see in the normal natural environment like schools uh, with groups of boys hanging out together and groups of girls hanging out together. The one it, one of the exceptions is uh, mental mental illness. So the the um, the rates of mental illness suddenly increase after puberty, and that's true for both boys and girls. But the types of mental illness are different. So uh, before puberty, for example, depression is has very low rates in childhood, and it's about the same for boys and girls. After puberty, uh, twice the number of girls um, suffer depression compared with boys. There's a really big gender difference there, and we don't know why. We don't know whether it's something to do with the estrogen that suddenly increases at puberty in girls. Maybe it's because... Uh, a, a sort of social effect of going through puberty. Suddenly, society treats girls quite differently before and after puberty. Uh, maybe it's other reasons that could explain these explain these gender differences, like increased um, uh, worry about social evaluation in girls compared with boys. For boys, um, teenage boys uh, um, experience more substance abuse problems than girls. Suicide is more common in boys and men than it than it is in girls and women. So there. There are gender differences for sure, but when you try to hone in on them using really precise psychological paradigms and looking at their trajectory across development, they, it's very hard to find. Um, hello. I would like to um, ask about responsibility because uh, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that ever since the beginning of times, so let's put it that way, um, everybody has been <coughs> seeing teenagers as irresponsible, loud, etc. And I mean, in many countries, uh, as a teenager, you could get into prison uh, from the age of 14, 16. And as a teenager, you're forced to make decisions that uh, will impact your whole entire life, career decisions, grades. It's very important, but at the same time, many people don't take teenagers seriously and just regard them as children. How do you think we could change that? And do you think we should grant teenagers more responsibility? I do actually, yeah. And I and I don't have a solution for how to change society's act, uh, attitude towards teenagers. You see it very much with um, with Greta. I can't remember her name. Is it Thunberg? Greta Thunberg. Thunberg. Yeah, the yeah. climate um, activist. Yeah, the climate change activist. There's been an interesting reaction to her. I mean. It's very odd, you know, I think if she was a middle-aged man, or a woman, maybe, but let's just say a middle-aged man, people would take her way more seriously than they do as a 16-year-old girl. Why? Because the content of what she's saying is the same as if someone else said it. But, um, but on the one hand, she's taken seriously because she's, getting, she's very vocal and she's getting a voice and uh, people are listening up. But if you look at the uh, criticism of her on social media it's uh, it's unbelievable how people feel that they can treat her because she is a 16 year old girl it's really a strange thing and i'm not quite sure how how we change this in society but we need to and probably through increased awareness of um adolescence and adolescent development and adolescent strengths for example uh we might we might be able to do that i mean i think i think it's already happening actually i think it's already happening where society is becoming gradually a bit more positive towards adolescence in some ways. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of um, one of the one of the questions that are, is asked a lot is about voting. I don't know about in this country, but in the UK, voting for the government, you, there's an um, 18 year old cut off, so you can't vote until you're 18. And there's a question of whether adolescents should be able to vote when they're 16. And actually, 
I don't really have much to say on that other than I cannot think of a single piece of evidence to argue against that. I can't think of any reason why well, Adler... Well, you said it there. <laughs> You're Pardon? in favour of it. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, don't, I, can't t I can't say from a kind of scientific point of view, oh, this scientific study proves why 16-year-olds should be able to vote, but I can't think of a single reason why they shouldn't yeah. from, the, from, the, from the evidence. Um, yeah, so maybe if we, if we empowered young people by allowing them things like voting rights, then things would gradually change. But there are, there are all sorts of inequalities, um, uh, even, in, even in Western countries, for teenagers compared with over 18-year-olds, which just doesn't seem particularly fair. I think we can take, yes, here in front. And then one more question, and then unfortunately we'll have to wrap it up. Um, hi, a very simple question. You were talking about how important it is that teenagers sort of know what's going on in their brain. Could you direct us at like some sources on <coughs> online? Um, yeah, there's quite a lot. Um, uh, there's there's a. Uh, I did a TED talk <laughs> on it, but actually that's quite old now. Um, and there's 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 a whole load of stuff actually. Um, there are. Uh, Websites, um, for example, the Society for Neuroscience website has something on the teen brain. By her book, I'm sorry, you wouldn't say it, but by her book, there's <laughs> a lot of it, right? Yeah, a lot of sources, really a yeah, lot of sources. Studies. That's aimed at um, parents and teachers, but I know a lot of teenagers who've yeah. read it too. Um, there are books actually aimed at teenagers themselves, so specifically aimed at teenagers. Um, there's a book by Nicola Morgan called Blame Your Brain, which is pretty good. She's a British uh, journalist, and um, yeah, that's it's a scientifically accurate book. It's really nice for teenagers to read. Again, I think it's empowering for teenagers to understand what's going on in their own brains. They have a right to that. One more question? Good. Oh, yes. <laughs> in the first row. So I was curious, with all your research that you've done, I don't know if you have children or not, but what, um, if you could boil it down, what are the differences in, um, what are the things that you feel like you've learned that have really changed um, in, you know, boiled down nugget form mm. uh, towards what you thought was the case with teenagers and what you now know thanks to evidence and research? Yeah, I do. I have, t I have teen teenage children. Um, I... Uh, well, I think that a lot of teenage behaviours uh, were, were used to be put down to, and some people still did put them down to, um, just kind of insolence and laziness and being a rebel for the sake of it and making stupid, irrational decisions. Now, I think none of that is right. And actually, all of those things have, a, have some kind of biological adaptive reason behind them. Um, they're there for a reason. And we need to be able to understand that rather than just trying to kind of eradicate those behaviours. Like, I certainly don't think that we should try to get rid of all risk-taking in teenagers. That's not the point. Risk-taking is really positive often. Where would we be if we didn't take any risks? You have to um, take risks if you want to learn, learning by trial and error, for example. So it's not a question of eliminating all risk-taking, but trying to understand uh, why teenagers take risks and, for example, the social context is really useful in, in terms of educating young people about risks. Uh, another thing is the real importance of peer influence, which I just mentioned at the end, but actually that's really what mostly what we're interested in in my group. And um, this has huge implications for how you how we as a society deal, deal with teenagers and try to encourage young people to make really positive decisions because... <clears throat> we, we pretty much know that teenagers don't have any problem understanding risk or evaluating risk, but in the heat of the moment, they all take a risk if they're with their friends. And what we also know is that from public health studies is that <clears throat> um, the interventions that work best for young people, particularly young adolescents between about age 11 and 15, is uh, interventions that are led by the teenagers themselves. So just, I'll end with one example of this because it's such a nice example of a, um, a study a few years ago in America which was looking at school-based interventions for um, bullying, so anti-bullying interventions. Um, they worked with 56 schools in New Jersey 
Um, half the schools carried out their anti-bullying campaigns as usual, run by the teachers. And the other half, um, the young people themselves, were educated, a group, a select group in each school of young people themselves, were educated about the negative and harmful effects of bullying. And they, then they were incentivized to go and run their own anti-bullying campaigns. So they did things like debates and parties and wristband campaigns. In those schools where the young people led the anti-bullying campaigns, that led to a 25% reduction in incidents of bullying over the next year compared with the schools where the anti-bullying campaigns were led by teachers. Young people really care about what each other think, and that's we shouldn't ignore that. That's exactly where we should focus in on if we want to encourage young people to make positive decisions. Thank you very much, Sarah Chain. Thanks. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thanks. So everyone who would like to buy the book or Paul's book, um, they can do that outside. Also, there's uh, drinks, a little uproar for any, anyone who is able to stay. You're welcome. Thank you very much for coming here and have a good evening.